Hi everyone, Robert Rutherford here. We're at episode 17. Welcome to Off the Wall. Uh, we have a really super interesting guest in here today. We've got Jeff Potter from HMC Architects. He's a spec writer over there and he's a super young guy and really smart. So really looking forward to this. <laughs> Jeff, how are you doing today? Hey, good, and you, Rob? Good, good, good. Thanks for having me on. This is this is cool. This is a great great opportunity. I really appreciate you stepping up and doing this. this oh is yeah, this is this is great. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and uh, you know, try to listen to it every week. But it's it's great. It's a good listen. So thank you very much. Thank you. How long have you been with HMC? Uh, I've been about four years in October. Uh, so I started back in so what's that 2015 um just as a, a spec coordinator so uh i was basically an assistant to the spec writers and we had four spec writers uh at the time and uh or four in our department at the time and so i would just assist them out with you know developing project manuals and um you know just tedious tasks around the office stuff like that mm -hmm. and just kind of worked my way up fell in love with with what I was learning and uh, really decided that this is something that I love and that I want to uh, really just invest the time in to grow and, and learn. Um, and so I did. And, and now I'm, we're two spec writers basically across the whole firm. Um, so I, I handle a lot of projects and I like to say I, I run the place, but you know, that, <laughs> that's just a matter of time. Yeah. Just a matter of time. Right. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, so it, it's a great, great experience and I've learned a lot and still have a learn a lot to learn. It's not, uh, it's not something where my background, um, really, I should say complements this industry. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of things that I don't know. And so I try to learn something new every day. And if Good. I don't learn something new every day, um, you know, I try at least, you know, uh, double up the next day just because there's so much out there oh, and yeah. there's, you know, a lot of industry terms and stuff like that. Like I'm not too familiar with, but it's, you know, Google's a great thing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> when in doubt, Google it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And YouTube is great too. It's like, so how do they, how do they attach a laugh to the wall, right? Just Google it, yep. pop it up on YouTube, and it's like, oh, okay, that's what they're talking about, and we're talking about my specs, you know. Sure. Um, so it's definitely a learning experience for me right now. But you know, I'm, you email me, I'm not afraid to say, hey, I don't know, but I'll come back and say, I'll get you an answer. I'll find out, mm -hmm. and no matter how long it takes, I'll get you an answer that's acceptable to whether it's the owner, or contractor, or just the project team. So. Mm -hmm. So I thought like uh, to do spec writing, you, you would have been like a designer or an architect first mm -hmm. and it didn't work that way. No, it didn't. So backstory, I like to say that I'm lucky basically, but it's more that I'm just blessed that I was able to, to get this position. So I grew up in, in Upland. I went to uh, Damien High School in Laverne and did, re did really well in school, but college was one of those things where you know, it was like, I didn't test well, so I didn't get into a lot of my, my top choices. And I was slated to go to San Marcos down in San Diego. And, you know, it's like, yeah, this is cool. This will be great. But what do I want to do, actually? Um, and my brother at the time was like, hey, become a pharmacist. The needs there by 2020, they're going to be, I think it was like 85% under staff, something crazy like that. Oh, wow. And you make good money. Mm -hmm. And me, I'm like, that's great. Like I could do that. I can count pills. Like I like science, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like I can stand behind a counter and, and make great money. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was my goal was to become a pharmacist. And then about halfway through my senior year in high school, uh, I ended up applying to a couple schools out in North Dakota. Um, my mom's from there, so I have a whole bunch of family out there. So it made sense for me to, you know, go out there and experience different life. So I, I got accepted, went out there, visited the schools, fell in love with, with the Midwest and the schools. And the school that I ended up going to, North Dakota State, had a, a pharmacy program. Um, so it worked out perfect. So they geared the uh, the curriculum towards become a, becoming a pharmacist. And then they had... Uh, 
a pharmacy school that you could apply to after two years. And then afterwards you became, you know, a doctor in, in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I scratched San Marcos and I, I went to, uh, North Dakota state and, and fell in love with it. Um, two years in, I dropped out of pharmacy school. It didn't work. I couldn't pass OCHEM. Couldn't pass an and Fizz. And that was, for me, it was like, what am I going to do now? You know, I don't have, uh, any insight into really what I want to do. And, um, I don't know what I want or what I would love to do. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the, the problems was I didn't know what I loved at that point. So some people never find that out. Exactly. And that's, that's a huge thing. Like I, I love what I do now and I never complain about going to work. You know, mm -hmm. Sunday it's like, oh, I got to go to work. You know, I got to work five days this week. Me, it's like, you're, no, you're, no complaints. You have passion. Exactly. You know, the, the biggest gripe I have is, oh, I got to work uh, five days this week instead of four, you know, because we're on the nine. 980 schedule so i work nine hours monday through thursday and then the fridays i do work i work eight hours so that that's my biggest gripe right it's like oh, i don't have a three-day weekend um so that that was the biggest thing trying to find out what i loved um i love math i love statistics so i was like well what if i go into to statistics and i remember the phone conversation with my mom she was you know what are you what are you thinking now and i said statistics like I'm taking just a general course right now and I really love it and she goes what the hell are you gonna do with statistics and I said that's a good question and I look back at it now and it's like I should have kept with statistics because you look at the not just the construction industry but baseball NFL yeah. NBA analytics is huge yeah and now in the construction construction industry analytics are finally catching up. Um, so that was, you know, one thing that I look back like, Oh, maybe I should have done statistics, but basically to get done in two years, because I didn't want to, you know, have to do five years. Um, I majored in criminal justice. So I decided, Hey, let's be a cop, you know, to make great money, great schedule, great career. Um, dangerous as hell though. Very dangerous. Right. Yeah. And that was one of the things that my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, was, you know, back and forth, like, I don't know if I want to have a family with, you know, a police officer because it's dangerous. I don't know, you know, if mentally I, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had talked about it, gone back and forth and ultimately decided, like, yeah, this is what I want. She said, you know what, I'll support you 100% and said, all right, that that's perfect. So um, went ahead, finished my, my college up with a criminal justice degree. Um and during those final two years, it was really that the political landscape of the country was, was changing, right? The attitude towards, towards cops, the thin blue line, the flags were coming out. And yep. so it was really an eye catcher for me. Like, is this something that I, I really want to do? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was like, well, let's give law school a try. So I, you know, I, I bought the, I think it's the, the law sat, the, or the LSAT entrance exam books and, studied you know just a little bit took the exam and flopped on the exam so i didn't even apply to law school um so i was like well let's go back to being a cop so uh went around to different agencies and just kind of went through the motions and um didn't make it very far uh i got all the way through a background with one but my job history is very um minimal so um their response to me was, we don't want to hire you because you don't have work that shows responsibility at, at the workplace. We can't prove that you know how to handle responsibility. Wow. And basically, you know, talking to <clears throat> family, friends and stuff, it's there's candidates that are too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And those are the guys that they don't necessarily want to hire because it's too good to be true on paper, but we know there's there's got to be something, right? Yes. So that's, you know, family, friends told me, and it's like, all right, so what am I going to do now? Apply to all these other departments and have the same, you know, thing come back, make it through all the testing, go to the background. And, mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, didn't want to spend the time. So at that time I, I was working at Uline. Um, so big warehousing, you know, company and, uh, 
selling boxes and yeah. plastic and everything. Yeah, everything. Giant. Yeah. yeah, and that's my my work history. So I started and uh, after my senior year, I was doing summer work for a company that did uh, camping kits for for motorhomes. So you rent a motorhome and then they you could buy these boxes and it had sheets, blankets, towels, you know, kitchen appliances, plates, everything you you would need for this camping RV that you rented. Um, so that was kind of my summer job. Um, I didn't do any internships or anything, you know, during college. So that was really all I had to fall back on when applying to jobs. So uh, after I graduated, I went to work for Costco, actually, and was working in the, the warehouse in the morning and stocking stuff. And that's when I realized I hate working weekends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. I mean, I'm a Monday through Friday guy and you know, I'm not a big fan of overtime too. So I, I learned that real quick that I don't want a job in the future or a career path, one with weekends and, and two with overtime. And that really conflicts, right. With being a police officer. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. because they, they work nights, they work weekends, they work a butt ton of overtime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that was part of that, that process too, of me moving away. So, you know, after I graduated, I stayed a year back at, uh, North Dakota State. My my wife finished up school back there, so we came back and, you know, trying to look for a job. I, this was 2014, so it was right when the economy was starting to, you know, pick up. Yep. Um, it was tough finding a job. You know, I I remember I had several interviews with kind of like sales, you know, and mm -hmm. um, it was like outside sales, so it was straight commission. You know, one was for uh, like identity theft protection software um you know another was kind of like office supplies stuff like that and you know it really was just trying to find a job to get paid at that time and um you know probably i think it was it was september of 2014 um i got hired on at uline and that really kind of changed my career path and career thinking um they hired me on as a, a warehouse packer so I was out there in the warehouse packing UPS boxes and they really taught me uh, speed mm -hmm. and accuracy because without those, you didn't survive. Yeah, they're pumping a lot of shit out of Oh, them. man. Yeah. My warehouse just a day did 15 million bucks Wow. a day on average. Is that right? Yeah, 15 million. Their bucks. catalog is huge, though, dude. Oh, I mean, it, it's incredible. It's They got a lot of stuff. It's incredible. Yeah. And I remember my first two weeks there, I, I shipped someone a wrong package. And it was one of those eyewash stations that you throw up on the wall. I mean, I think it was like 600 bucks, right? And shipped it to the wrong person. And came back the next day and were like, hey, you messed up. And this was within the 90 days, right? So I was afraid, like, am I going to get fired over this? You know, I mean, because I messed up and they look for perfection. And this is, you know, my first two weeks. Like, am I going to survive? And luckily they kept me on. But what I found was amazing was any error that was over 500 bucks went to the CEO's desk. And she looked it over. The yes, owner sir. of the company, right. anything over 500 bucks, she looked at and wanted to know why that error was made. Wow. Yeah, which pretty strict. Very strict, very strict. I huh. mean, and they they focus on, uh, I think it was called that your air rate basically. So you know, up on your little workstation, you had a piece of paper that showed your air rate, and the top guys they were ninety nine point seven percent. You know, because we did so many orders a day. Mm -hmm. You know, if you miss one up, it would knock that down. And there wow. were people, you know, low nineties, but. I mean, if you drop below a certain percentage, you got put on basically a, a watch list that said, hey, you got to figure it out. So it it was pretty amazing. Wow, that's tight. Yeah, it, it was. But when you're dealing with 15 million bucks, yep. right? Per day. I mean, per day. Wow. I mean, it it's incredible. And that, uh, just the, the UPS portion that I was in for about 10 months, I think they were about seven or eight. So they were about half of that. That um, is amazing. Maybe a little bit less, but yeah, right. it was it was incredible. And the hours were, you know, 10 to 7, but it was really 10 to 8 because of all the overtime mm -hmm. that they had. And then, yeah. uh, you know, about 10 months in, I got promoted to a forklift driver. So instead of packing the boxes, I got to go around and pick the orders, basically. So mm -hmm. I got forklift training and all that, and mm -hmm. that was fun. Yeah. That, was, that was a good time. Um, 
but it still was just, you know, it was those things that I didn't love that I wanted to go in and, uh, you know, I complained about going into work like, man, I got to go into work today. Don't want to, it's going to be hot or it's going to be cold or, you know, my back hurts. I, you know, sure. Just all the usual complaints. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, about that time I was like, all right, I had just finished up, you know, with that background check, trying to become a police officer and it, that didn't go my way. So it was like, all right, what's next? What, what can I do? So, uh, I actually had my wife just start applying for jobs for me out on the internet. I said, here's my resume, apply to as many as you can. I don't care what it is. And one of those jobs was HMC. And so, uh, wow. yeah, it, which was funny. And I got the email, right? I get it on your phone. I saw it and was like, HMC architects, why'd you apply to an architecture firm? Like I have no background. Like I don't even know, uh, you know, I had no idea what stucco and Portland cement plaster were, even though it's synonymous, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like my boss for say was like, yeah, Portland cement. And I'm like, what's that stucco? Oh, okay. Like I kind of know what that is. Yeah, right. I've heard of that before. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so she applied and, uh, I got a call for an interview. So I went in and I like to think I'm a pretty good interviewer just because with all the police departments, you got to be mm -hmm. quick on your feet and sure. with the scenario questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went in and I think the applicant field kind of helped in my favor too. Um, you know, they had some other people that were asking for a lot of money or they, you know, they just weren't right the right fit. So, um, I got hired not knowing what a spec was, not knowing wow. what a project manual was, no not shit. knowing what an architect wow. really did. I, re I remember in high school, I had uh, a kid in my math class. I was a senior and he was a sophomore, smart guy. And he's like, yeah, I, I want to go to architecture school. And he had, you know, his portfolio already. And I'm like, architects sound cool, but I can't design. Like you asked me for a building, you're going to get a box. <laughs> you know, yep, yep. and it's not going to be a straight box. It's going to be, you know, well, that's good. They like angles. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, uh, I'm like architecture, you know, I'm, I'm not good with design, but we'll give it a shot. Right. So my first day there, I remember, uh, I think you remember Joe, yep. um, he's retired now, but mm -hmm. he sat me down and he showed me what a spec was. I mean, he showed me the CSI outline of a spec. He told me what an architect does, what the contractor does. Mm -hmm. For that first month, I basically just read papers on delivery methods. So I learned about design build. I learned about bid, bid, or I designed bid build projects. Um, I learned about CM at risk projects. I learned about integrated project delivery. I learned all that. I learned about drawings, um, that relationship that drawings to specs have. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was, it was overwhelming. I'll bet. You know, it was, I it mean, was, you had no freaking clue. No, no, it was crazy, you wow. know? And so they would basically what the spec writers would do is they'd redline stuff and they'd give it to me and then I'd, I'd transfer it over onto the computer, not knowing anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And it, it was crazy. It was, that is totally bizarre. Yeah. Right. And, and I look back and I'm like, how, like, how does this fit? Right. Yeah. How, and how am I succeeding? My research background, because that's what I did in college. I read papers. I read, you know, uh, studies. Mm -hmm. and I learned how to research. And that's what's really and that's how you me get out. your stats, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's helped me out a lot. Um, and being able to understand, you know, the nitty gritty of certain aspects of, you know, say a wall assembly. I still have a hard time conceptualizing Mm -hmm. you know if someone shows me a detail it still takes me a minute or two to like all right what exactly are we looking at here um but eventually you know i'll, I'll get it yeah um i can't draw you know if someone told me to hey can you de detail out the this parapet condition it's like i don't know where to start no i'm the spec writer exactly you but draw it, it. <laughs> exactly exactly right but if you showed me a parapet detail mm -hmm. i can kind of piece together if it looks good or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a wall condition, um, come to me, you know, a couple weeks ago and they were like, yeah, we, we want to, we're looking for, uh, something that fits in this kind of condition down here at the base of the wall because they had a retaining wall with living space on the inside. And then the, the stucco wall came down and they needed something for it to kind of like drain out 
into like the planter box area. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, but why do you have continuous insulation below grade? Why do you have gyp sheathing below grade that, that I don't think you can do that. Um, so I, you know, I worked it through mm-hmm. with them and figured out like, Hey, you can't use, you know, CI, you can't use, um, any of the typical manufacturers out there. I think what you got to use is, you know, an XPS or I think the other one's like an XP or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, found a manufacturer, sent that to him. And I said, take out the jip board to take out the sheet and you can't use that below grade. Um, so they had to revise a few things, but you know, that's some of the things that I, I look at and that I can help them with. I don't know where to start if I'm to draw it, mm-hmm. but I can pick apart details and it's almost like, I'm sure with you too, right? Like you look at a detail and it just seems off. Like it doesn't seem right. And that, that's how it is to me. Like something's just not right here. Well, that's awesome though. You understand it, um, in a pretty short period of time Yeah, to, to be able to pick up on things like that, that are not supposed to be there. Yeah. It, and and uh, you're working with your team. Yeah. <clears throat> we're picking which, that out. Which is huge. Yep. Um, I remember, you know, three months in, I knew more about specs than some of the people at my firm. Uh, that's <laughs> that's know? amazing. Wait, which, which you that look really back is. and it's like, one, that shouldn't be, but two, yeah. it's it's how quickly I picked it up. Yeah. And and my previous boss, Joe, I mean, he was a huge mentor to me. Yeah. And that, that helped a lot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you, you tell your son this what you put into it is what you get out Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. It's it, that's that's life, man. It is. You know, and it it took me a while to realize that. Mm-hmm. You know, in high school I just coasted, college I coasted, wanted to get done and then found this career path and realized if I don't put anything into it, I'm not moving. I'm stuck, right? Well, but the thing is though is it 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 got your interest. You know, it was totally it was off the wall. Yeah, for, it was. For something uh that your wife actually found for you. Yeah. And you had no clue. And that was, you knew a guy in school that wanted to be an architect, but that wasn't in your wheelhouse. Yeah. You, but you didn't know what you wanted to do. Yeah. We, we were trying to find that. Which, which was huge, right? Yeah. I mean, I know on previous podcasts, they ta- you talked about the, you know, pushing college and all these young kids. Yeah. And it's, for me, college was, it was a definite, like I was going to go, I, I needed it. Um, I needed it to grow up. I needed to experience a different lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I went. But you look at some of these kids, and I remember one of them, my first day, he was a sophomore, and he wanted to become a pharmacist. And he's like, pharmacy, it's easy. You know, I got an A in chemistry, A in biology. Like, it's it's so easy. And, you know, we were, you know, partying that night, whatever, and uh, he was telling me some stories and stuff. And never really connected to him but mm-hmm. later on that year i saw him and he dropped out because he couldn't take it sophomore year he couldn't take school i don't know what ended up happening to him but it's just one of those things where college isn't made for everybody no you no. know and it's being in the construction industry if you start right out of high school i mean you're making good money yes you are you know you I, are. I have a brother-in-law that works for for standard and you know he's he finally reached that, that peak where I think he's like a journeyman level and yep. he's working on the West and down the street and he, he has a good living. I mean, yes. You know, he's providing for his family and he works his butt off. That's oh, for he sure. Does. You know, I, I hear some of the stories come back and the hours that he works and mm-hmm. I think he's working like six days right now, but mm-hmm. it's worth it. You you're know? earning your money. Oh, exactly. When you're, when you're in that game. It, it, but the thing is, is they've always stayed ahead of inflation. Yeah. And they've done a very good job at that. Yeah. When you're in the union, if mm-hmm. you're non-union, they're they're taking advantage of those guys. But the the union has done a really really good job of staying ahead of inflation to where you can drive new cars, you can buy a house. Uh it now in Southern California, it you know, the cost of uh housing here is so expensive, but it always has been that way and what ends up happening is uh, the guys move out to these areas north or east Mm -hmm. you know because you can only go so far west right and then you're hitting the water and then you're really talking some bucks but you know moving east or moving up north in these new areas where they're building starter homes and stuff like that they buy a house there and then if they're making some money on it 
they start moving in closer, but a lot, a lot of them love it out there and yeah. they end up staying out there and construction, the work is all over the place. Oh, exactly. You, you, I mean, you go he, where it is. Yeah. He was down in downtown LA for a while and mm -hmm. then he was at, you know, Pomona. And so he's been all over, but I mean, the hours that he works, I mean, it's not like he's really hitting traffic too much. And then he lives mm -hmm. out, uh, east of us. So he's, you know, going home, he's against traffic, yep. but you know, I, I look at it and it's like, yeah, maybe I should have done that out of high school, right? You know, but uh, shit, you'd be a journeyman by now. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you'd probably be running work. Potentially, yeah. maybe yeah. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, but yeah, I I had to go to college. That was, mm -hmm. you know, my mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it definitely helped me where I'm at today. Um, did they were did they want to see a degree from you when they, when you did the interview? You know, I think they did. And I even think they wanted architecture experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember one part of the interview, they were talking about the project manual. And uh, they're like, yeah, we, we have one on our desk. Let's go get it. And so they brought it back and threw it in front of me. And I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what is that, right? Yeah, that's a lot of reading. And I told them, I said, if it involves research, I can go through that and I can research anything in that book. And I think that's what, what sold them, um, you know, having that willing, willingness to dive into that book head on and understand it and ask, not only understand it, but ask questions about it, mm -hmm. um, I think was a selling point for them. Um, and also I think being moldable, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. if you're someone who's older, you're not moldable, you're, <clears throat> you know, you're stuck in your ways. Yeah. So they, from the get-go, they taught me firm standards and I really, really try to hold those true. Um, you know, I, I don't like putting people necessarily, if you want to say in their place, but it's, Hey, watch out for this or, Hey, that's not, you know, standard practice here. This is typically what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it really helped me. Um, and now, you know, my career path is, is exploding. I have so many, you know, bright ideas out there that I, I want to get done. And I'm totally that millennial because I want it now type mm -hmm. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, I want it now. I I have this great idea about a product database. And it's like, I want it now. Yeah, but, I was going to ask you about that. I'm seeing some posts on there. So you're, you're making some moves on some um, innovation. Yeah, definitely. So we just started... Um, finally connecting the Revit model to specs. I mean, we've had the software capability to do it for about 10 years now, mm -hmm. um, but no one, no one's taking the leap. Mm -hmm. So I sat down one day when I was still spec coordinator and I was probably like six months in and I literally downloaded the software help manual, printed it out, brought it home and read it and took notes on it so that I could understand how it was, uh, basically how how it worked mm -hmm. um so i set everything up it took me a while it took yeah. me a long time um you know we have 1500 sections master specs Jesus. um so it was like where where do i want to begin right like obviously stucco is a popular one but we have four different stucco sections we've got one for steel construction with continuous insulation we've got one with steel construction without uh, continuous insulation. So, you know, back in the day when you didn't need it, mm -hmm. we've got wood and we've got CMU and it's like, I don't want to spend time on all four. So how do I find the data that tells me what sections we use most? So through conversation with some of our IT people, um, I was able to go in the server and figure out the most common sections that we use. I can do it by project basis. I can do it by yearly basis, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And, it, no surprise, joint sealants and painting by far the most common. You know, every project needs joint sealants and every project needs paint. Yep. So those are by far the most common. So from there, I narrowed it down. I started, I think, with about 150 of the most common. Mm -hmm. um, and I just basically, I say coded, um, but I basically geared them up to be set for the system. And so it took me two years to get to a good point. Mm -hmm. Um but we rolled it out and we've got projects that are, that are doing it. Um, good for you. And it cuts down my hours immensely. Yeah. I mean it without it, just a typical DD project manual design development. It'd take me about nine hours 
just, you know, typical, if you're talking 80 spec sections, about nine hours, I'm down to under four. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I, you, you went in a direction you had no freaking clue you were going to even go no. at that end of it. No. Where no. you're, you're kind of, you're changing the game. I am. Yeah. And it's, it's not only, you know, time management, it's culture too. It's making sure like, Hey, specs matter again. Specs are cool. Specs are fun. Mm -hmm. Specs are sexy, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a challenge. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still trying to get that culture change across. Um, and that's one of the things I am doing on LinkedIn is it's like personal branding, right? Yes. And it's, I'm out there. I'm Good trying for you. Yeah. I'm trying to make things better just like you are, um, yes. but in the spec world, yeah. not just within my firm, but eventually, hopefully across the whole industry. Well, here's the deal. You're not just talking about it. You're fucking doing it. Yeah, okay? exactly. And that's awesome. Exactly. That's it, good stuff. And it, it took me a while. So like yeah. I want to do a blog, you know, just daily life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I am one of the youngest specifiers. You are. Out there. Um, usually uh, spec writers are usually in the game for 25 years. Yeah. To, but the thing is, you, you have a super open mind. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and you, um, you, this was your destiny, dude. Yeah. I, I am learning. It really that. was. Yeah. And it it's was really a trip. It is. And it's, you know, I, I had a comment the other day from a PM and it really kind of moved me because I've, I've worked my ass off for the past, you know, almost four years now trying to be able to sit into a room and for people to listen. Because when I walk into the room, it's like, oh, what's this young kid? He's a spec writer. Like, he doesn't know shit, right? right? Or yeah. who's he telling me what to detail or what products to use? Sure. And I had this PM tell me the other day, we were talking, I forget what we were talking about. And he goes, something to the effect like, you know, we, we respect you. We respect your opinion. And I said, thank you. Yeah. I mean, that that moved me. Mission I, accomplished. Exactly. I said, yeah. I've, I've worked hard for that yep. and I don't want to lose it, but thank you. That, that means a lot to me. Um, so, you know, going back to the, the, the data side of it, I mean, I'm trying to get the analytics. I'm trying to figure out ways that we can improve. Mm -hmm. Um, and one thing is that product database. Um, you know, how many times, are, are my guys out in the field or they're out at DSA or Oshpot and they're trying to figure out like, hey, we got to find this ICC report. Where is it at? Or we got to find this fire requirement. Like, where is this cut sheet at type thing? Mm -hmm. Like, and sometimes manufacturers' websites, they're terrible. Like, mm -hmm. you might need to log in to find stuff or they might just not have it and the rep has to send it to you. So I'm like, why don't we create a product database of everything that we specify that has all the product data, all the ICC reports, all the all the other testing reports. That way, it's readily available. So I did I did a poll, right? Because this is a huge undertaking. Yeah. So I'm like, it's a great yeah. idea to me. Like I'm I'm down for it. But I did a poll on our, our internet, and I got about um, sixty people out of like the three hundred that we that mm -hmm. we employ, mm -hmm. and they all said yes, it'd be great. So it, it's something I I still have to get approval for, but it's something I'm looking at. Um, but I want to take a step farther because my question is, why do we fight the contractor so much when it comes to, when it comes to products, if we're specifying product a, and we find out it's being substituted 70% of the time, why are we still specifying that product? Very good point. R right. Yes. Like, yes, you know, because that that's money away from us Absolutely. for answering you know. that RFI or that substitution request. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a product that always gets a change order, always gets an RFI. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Like are our details messed up. The specs not clear. Why? Mm -hmm. um, and the work that we do, we do a lot of, of public bid. So, um, you know, that's one thing that I think that can improve and we track all that, you know, we track substitutions and stuff, but not to the level that it needs to be. And that's my ultimate goal is to be able to create a platform where we can get this data so that we can specify the, the correct products out there. Um, that's smart. That's really smart because you, you get that. You don't get paid for RFIs. No. no. Nobody does. No, that, that's, that's time wasting everybody's us. money. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was told a dollar amount um, for every RFI that comes through our, our door. Yeah. And it almost knocked me off my feet. Yeah. 
it was incredible. Yeah, it's and amazing. Yeah, because it, it's it's high dollars. Oh, it it, really it's is. huge. And you talk about all the hands that it goes through. Mm-hmm. You know, because if a, if you know PM might not know it, he's going to shove it off to the team. And if they might not know it, it's going to come to me. And you're talking about our hourly rates. I mean, yeah. oh my god. Yeah, that, that's incredible. It is. So, and then also, shit, you're going to be getting a raise, man. Yeah. One day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, but, you know, from a contractor's point of view, too, I know you guys have a checklist. Like, I'm not familiar with that side, but I know there's a checklist. And I know there, or maybe a mental checklist, where a contractor's going through going through the book. They're like, if I substitute for this product, I can make an extra 30K off of it. Like, mm-hmm. I, I know that has to happen. Absolutely, it so, does. So, why aren't we going with that and saving, Hey, you know, that design element that we want to do, it was $30,000, but we had to cut it out because we couldn't afford it. Well, because you're specifying this one product that the contractor knows he's going to substitute for and is probably going to get approved. There's your extra $30,000 for another product basically, Mm -hmm. or savings to the owner. Right. And it's, I've always been told it's, you know, credit to the owner 90 cents on the dollar change order 10 cents over the dollar so mm-hmm. you know that 30,000 you know if it's going to be a credit the owner's not getting the full 30,000 you know exactly so why are we why are we playing these games yeah. you know well, like why don't we get the hard data because it's out there absolutely you just have is. to organize it and you just have to figure out how to interpret that data it, well the other thing is is somebody needed to take the initiative to do that oh yeah right? and and that's like you're kind of disrupting it. Yeah. That's a, awesome. A little bit. I mean, yeah. the, the problem is the technology is not there, mm-hmm. you know, and that's one part that I'm struggling with is, and I'm starting to, I just started this week actually going into SQL into database management, like computer code language. Um, we have an in-house developer and she's like, you know, we don't have time for this product database, but we'll sit aside a half hour a week during lunch and teach you so that you can do it. And I said, I'm in. Bring it on. Because this is something that not only can help my future, but can benefit the firm too, um, to be able to go in and find data. Like one of the things I want to do is I want to know how many times or how much time we spend in a specific spec section. So if we're in the stucco section for, you know, on average an hour per project, why is that? Why are we spending an hour in the stucco section when it, it's pretty general, right? Mm-hmm. Like not it much is. changes in a, in a stucco assembly. No. So why are we spending an hour? Is it because we're changing out products or, or what? Or if we're spending two minutes on average, okay, perfect. Mm-hmm. Like that's great. Like yeah. our spec seems to be dialed in. Um, that data is not there yet. I'm hoping it, it will be. Mm-hmm. But that's one of the avenues I see time management, how we can save time mm-hmm. and move forward. Yes. And it, it's pretty amazing one thing I figured out is pretty much no matter what project across the board for schools, they have the same typical 60 sections. Mm -hmm. So one way I was able to cut down at nine hours to under four developing a a project manual is what's great about our software is, you know, we have options in our spec and I sure you've seen our spec, right? Mm -hmm. The stucco spec, we've got bracketed options. Um, I've done over 200 projects in the last four years. So I know what gets specified. Exa- right? Yeah. Um, so one thing I did was I, it's called mapping and tagging. So basically you have, it's a checklist and then you just map a checkbox to the paragraph basically. And so everything that's standard that we use like, you know, 90% of the time, mm-hmm. uh, excuse me, I defaulted. So anything that's not defaulted is automatically turned off. So the mm-hmm. spec, I'm comfortable if a team, you know, like, hey, we need a spec, you know, three hours. I'm comfortable giving them what the model spits out to me mm-hmm. or what our software spits out. And it's close to 100% DD because 70% mm-hmm. of what's not needed is already taken out. And that's how I cut down the hours. That's and then it's up to smart. the project team and the architect mm-hmm. to tell me otherwise. So and that's one way that we differ as a firm. You know, we, there's only two of us. We've got seven offices all throughout California, Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's just two of us. We do over 110 projects a year. That's amazing. It is ranging from school portables 
to new schools, hospitals. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy. And it's just two of us. And that's one way that we manage it. Um, you know, we have a couple other, you know, um, things that we do to help manage it, but that's one of the main things yeah. that we do. Um, and it, you'd be amazed how much time it, it cuts down. Well, I mean, it has to, because, uh, before how, how many, before you were really implementing this technology, how many spec writers did you have? We had four. We had four, well, three spec writers and me, the coordinator. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, we got pro project tracking and I think the most, um, anyone ever did was in the, in the upper thirties per year. And it all averaged out between everyone would do like 30 to 40, you mm -hmm. know, um, and now we're down to two. That's amazing. And it, it's pretty crazy. That is. That and is now, really... it, you know, last year I did 85 projects. That's amazing. Yeah. That and I, really and that's just new projects that came. That's not continuous projects from the year before. Or, mm -hmm. So it, and thanks to this technology that that's allowed it to happen. Yeah. Um, and it's allowed me greater time to spend updating our, our master specs and to dive into this analytics too, mm -hmm. yep. which is, which is great. But you're doing a lot of that stuff on your own time. And that is, um, not a lot of people will do that. No, no. They, it, you're, you're passionate about it and you're learning and you like to learn. Yeah. Oh, I, I love to learn. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I struggled with was when my, my boss Joe retired, he was my, he was my teacher, my mentor. And it's, mm -hmm. All right, where do I where do I go to learn? You know, I have a great boss now. He's he's fantastic. He comes from the the construction admin side, so he's got all all that nailed down. He's on risk management, so he knows that aspect really well. Mm -hmm. So I go to him for a lot of things. But you know, I'm starting to get more involved in uh, webinars, learning mm -hmm. about things that way. Yeah. Or you know, in a couple months, I'm going to one about corrosion resistance with with paint. Mm -hmm. Um. And a lot more trade shows too, because um, that's where you you learn a lot about new products and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really instead of relying on someone else, it's really falling on me to sink or swim, basically. Yeah. Because after he retired, it could have been like, because I wasn't a spec writer at the time, so mm -hmm. technically, I wasn't supposed to be putting together manuals. Um, you know, I was just you know supposed to stay in my realm. Mm -hmm. um, but I took it upon myself to sit down and say. I have some ideas here. I have some ideas yeah. and I'm a valuable resource. So yeah, please make me a spec writer, <laughs> yeah. you know, type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, Sometimes if you don't ask, you don't get. Oh yeah. I you tell know? my wife that all the time. Like, so you, you, uh, but the thing is, is you could back it up because you took the initiative. Exactly. And people pick up on that, man. Oh yeah. They, they it, do. It, it's huge across, across my firm. It's, um, it is know, in hey, life. Oh, you know, definitely. There's a shitload of talkers out there. Oh, definitely. You know, step up. Yeah. Yeah, you know. it's it's one of those things where it was if I didn't step up, I probably wouldn't be here today. Exactly. You you'd, know, you'd be just lost in the mix, you know, just floating around. And uh, that is just super inspiring. Yeah, it, to hear it's, that. you know, my wife tells me I'm I'm cocky when I talk about work and stuff, but in, it comes across that way. But I am so humbled to be where I'm at. And I realize that I still have so much to learn. You know, I've been in this industry four years. I can't compete with someone that's been in it 30 years, you know, in the field condition wise. Mm -hmm. Like if someone came to me and said, Hey, we've got this field condition. What do we do? I don't, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Sure. I'll find you an answer. I'll mm -hmm. research it. Yep. I'll ask, I'll tell you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'll get you an answer eventually. But that's something that, you know, I'll, I'm learning to this day. Yeah. That'll come with time. Exactly. And, so, and, yeah. so I still have a long way to go. Um, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do too. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, running your own business and everything. I mean, it's, it's a different avenue, I'm sure. Well, I like learning new stuff all the time too. So like today, this is a big lesson for me. Yeah. I'm learning a lot of shit. Oh, good. Yeah, this is <laughs> awesome. That's good. This yeah. is really awesome to, to hear the story of, uh, how you just stumbled onto it. Yeah. Yeah. I tripped you know? onto it. Like I, like I tell everyone, I get lucky. You know, we have reps come in all the time. Like, how'd you start? I'm like, I literally got lucky. I mean, that's that's what I tell people, and it it's true. You know, I'm I'm blessed to be where I'm at. But um, you were open minded enough too to um, like, okay, I'll check that out. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. Like one of the one of the things I I learned in my schooling was, um, 
and it really helped was being dynamic Mm -hmm. and not static, Mm -hmm. especially when it came to policing. Um, because one of the most effective strategies out there is community policing, being proactive, mm-hmm. not just sitting back, being retroactive. Right. So I took that along with a couple other ideas that I learned from that whole part of my education yeah. and implemented them here. Mm-hmm. And being proactive is huge, not sitting back. Um, and also, I think just understanding what it takes to. I mean, I, I put in, you know, nine and a half, 10 hour days someday, um, at the office, you know, Mm -hmm. I get in at six 30 and it's not because I I'm busy. It's because I have stuff to read, to learn, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm working on the analytics portion. So I, you know, I'm still the old fashioned, even though I'm a millennial, I still like pen and paper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've got a notebook with all my ideas and, you know, questions to myself, Jeff, how does this work? Like, how are we going to do this? And so then I, you know, I sit down in the morning or after I'm done with all my work at the end of the day and it's like, oh yeah, okay, I, I can figure this out now. I, this is a good avenue to do or what additional questions come from that. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a learning process for sure. So, yeah. and implementing this whole new, you know, getting the specs from the Revit model, I had to be open um, because it, it changed our workflow and we had discussions and it was, well, how are we going to implement this in the firm? Like, what if people aren't open to it? They're not open. They're not going to change. Find someone who will be right. Well, I mean, you, the way technology is moving, exactly what you're talking about, like uh, construction is a caveman society. It right? is. These guys are, uh, they have tunnel vision. Oh yeah. yeah. We yeah. learned how to do this stuff a hundred years ago this way. And we went through all the trials and tribulations and, and uh, failures. And this is what we figured out. And this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And now with this technology, you know, finally construction is starting to get into this technology. And it's really, really good, like on the design end and what, what you guys are doing. It, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. But we've talked about it on previous episodes as it kind of ruining the craftsmanship very much so because like you said you still use pen and paper okay Mm -hmm. so you're doing it longhand right yeah yeah you're you're going back to basics on that stuff and that 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 works for you but all all of the starting points you need to learn it longhand oh yeah yeah that that's kind of what builds the character right yeah exactly i mean i i learned how to if you want to call it detailing, right? Like I can do a typical wall assembly now that I know what it looks like. Um, I learned how to do it by hand and now I can do it in Revit. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not I'm no master in Revit by any means and I, I can't work in it, <clears throat> but I know my way around enough to be able to do certain things. And, you know, I had to be able to learn to learn it because I needed to test out my system. Sure. You know, so yeah. I had to design brick or uh, not brick block buildings basically you know four walls roof you know windows doors to make sure it worked but Mm -hmm. you know it all starts with that that pen and paper you know Mm -hmm. just learning the basics first and then building upon that um and that's what i'm doing right now basically you know just laying the groundwork for my future and then you know eventually hopefully the technology will catch up and well, you're right in it, man. I mean, you're 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 there. You have the mind for it already, and you have the open mind. Yeah. You know, to there's a better way to do it. Yeah. And I'm going to research this. Oh yeah. I'm going to use the stats. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. And that that's funny because, and I don't know how I fell into it, but you know, my dad he was in the the box business, you know, and um, one of his things was time management. Like he always drilled that into me, like time management. And it eventually just got on to me. And my first, you know, job working in the warehouse, it was like, why are we doing it this way? We can save so much time if we're doing it this way, you know? So I was able to start to pick apart, you know, production lines Mm -hmm. um, and be able to pick apart inefficiencies in people. Um, I didn't implement it because I was, you know, 18, 19 years old. But in my head, I'm like, I could totally do this much better than you. And then, mm-hmm. then I guess I kind of got put in my place a little bit with Costco and Uline 
because those places are fantastic. You know, they're all about analytics. They've got, you know, every bay that they have, the product's in there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't just, you know, lay product around. Um, It's there for a reason, whether it's, you know, easily pickable or if it's always picked, you know, they have, they have their system. But I was able to learn from that Mm -hmm. and understand that time management is huge. And I brought that over to where I'm at now and pick apart. Why are we spending nine hours when we can do it in less? Yeah. You know, why are we, why are we still marking up specs by hand when we can have the conversation in, you know, basically a PDF reader and have it there instead of trade emails or, you know, do all this stuff. Like, let's just have everything in one spot, mm-hmm. cut down the time in between, you know? So it, it's, it's helped out a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely helped me out quite a bit. Like I said, getting down the project manual from nine hours to under four, yeah. that's six hours that another team member can have. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about hours and, and you know, how valuable they are to an architect, mm-hmm. six hours is, that's a lot. That's almost a full day. Yes. So it, it's pretty incredible. Um, and something that we didn't have was tracking how many hours we spent on projects so we had a budget you know like Mm -hmm. hey you've got 80 hours to do this like all right cool and you know very rarely did we go over and if we went over there was there were some issues um but i've got data from last year how many hours that myself and the other spec writer spent on projects just for me i think i went over 50 hours on a project maybe twice is that right so on an average project i'm spitting out probably a full week of work and that's it that's amazing yeah that and it amazing. there's some other factors to it uh, you know sure. you know culture being one where teams you know if i'm spending if i look and there's like 10 or 15 hours then i know the project team didn't really look at the specs or they didn't mark them up but if i'm spending 30 40 hours then i know it's a pretty good job but i rarely spend over 50 so exactly. if someone asked me for a proposal it's like 50 hours yeah. <laughs> well, know? it's even going to get it's even going to get better. Oh, yeah. What you're coming up with. Yeah, it, it will be so much better. And yeah. I'm when I started this, I made it general. Right. Because I didn't really know um, how everything fit together. I didn't mm-hmm. know how the different spec sections that made up a, a stucco wall assembly or a ceiling assembly or a roof assembly all fit together. So I made it really general. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going in. And making it so if you if you model a wall a stucco wall or just you know a a cement panel wall it's pulling everything in it's Mm. pulling in joint ceilings it's pulling in paint if you're doing an interior wall it's going to tell me if it's rated Mm -hmm. your door sections are going to tell me if it's interior exterior doors rated or non-rated i mean i've got the nitty-gritty down pretty well um all the loose ends yeah well partly um one of the big issues is the project team side, um, having them because there's a, it's basically an assembly code. It, it's a uniform at. So it's mm-hmm. so what estimators use to, you know, get the, the numbers on projects and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but they take that uniform at code and they're supposed to enter it into the family. And that's the hard part I have enforcing. Um, yeah. So it's, that's the part I'm trying to change as well. Culture wise is, if you just spend an hour and do your whole project, taking it in, just doing all the assembly codes, it saves me six hours. Mm-hmm. And usually if teams, if I have a project meeting, we call them spec parties, you know, make, make specs fun. Yeah. Um, you know, we got that, that term from, from another specifier. But so when we have a spec party and I'm like, hey, did you input the assembly codes in the Revit model? Oh, no, we didn't have time. And I tell them takes me an hour and with my background i expect you to be able to do it in an hour to two hours no more than that so if you can do that it saves me six hours and that's just up front and that's six hours that then you can do um add somewhere else sure you know yeah. so and they're like oh yeah we'll do it we'll do it for for that you know and unfortunately the models only go so far right yeah. Um, so that's something that trying to figure out, you know, how can we get more spec sections from these models when things aren't necessarily modeled, um, you know, all the way like mm-hmm. a DD model, 
you know, they're not going to have, they might not have floors modeled, right? They might just have a slab. Mm -hmm. um, they might not even have the details done yet. Right. So we're trying to figure out, you know, ways to get more specs from it. But, um, you know, trying to get that ingrained in people is, it's tough, but, yep. it, you know, it, it's coming along. Um, so Yeah, it, that'll take some time, but it, it sounds like um, people are open-minded about it. And it could be a mainstream deal for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's, you know, I, me and how the specs were viewed at my firm, it was, you know, oh, you know, they'll take care of it, you know, no big deal. And we just kind of did things on our own. Mm -hmm. And so, but now with all this new procedure and, and software that we have, I had to go into rooms with our managing principals and our CEO and our uh our new uh he's pretty much a director of architecture and sit down with him and say this is what needs to happen and for me i mean that was nerve-wracking right i I'll mean bet. going in front of the were you wearing a tie that day no no you know <laughs> I, I go to work every day in jeans and a, and a golf polo basically That's cool. yeah. so but you know i went in and I'm super nervous and you know, because these, these people affect firm decisions. I mean, they go out, they get the business and they, mm -hmm. they have authority. And so going in there, it was, it was intimidating, but came out, you know, successful. And, you know, they told me, Hey, good job, good presentation. And, you know, that allowed me to go to every other office that we have and, and train people. Right. That is so, awesome, man. so yeah, which is, which Congratulations is great. On Thank that. you. Yeah. It, it was, it was, uh, it was an adventure. I'll say that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and, and now such is life. Yeah, exactly. And now one of the, the great things is, and one of the gripes I have about the industry, right? I have tons of them, which is, I think partly because I, I'm an outsider, you mm -hmm. know, I don't yeah. have that, that background. Um, you're fresh in, in the industry. Exactly. So you can, you can look at things a little, and you're a thinker. A, yes, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Architecture school, at least in this area, they come out and they're not taught about construction documents. You know, we have an internship program and we have interns. Mm -hmm. They don't know what specs are. Really? I'm like, how do you guys not know what specs are? Well, they teach us more design, design theory. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the field of architecture is starting to recognize like, oh, you know, design still important. You know, you've got to be able to get business based off your design. Um, but can be being able to recognize construction documents, mm -hmm. being able to read specs and that relationship between what you draw and what's specified is huge. Um, so when we get these interns in, I sit down with them for four hours and I just go over specs. And I, you know, just lay it all for them, lay it out all there for them. Um, I don't try to sc <clears throat> scare them, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is intimidating to say, hey, this is 50% of the contract deliverable to the owner. Yeah. And in my view, it's not necessarily the specs that are screwed up. It's the drawings that cause litigation most of the time at our firm. And so... Uh, the specs save your butt, you know? Well, most guys in, in the walls and ceilings industry, mm -hmm. before they even look at the plans, they look at the specs. Oh yeah. They, they want to see what's in there and then they start digging into it for the wall types and so forth. Oh, I'm sure. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, that's where they start because one of the running jokes that I have, um, you know, if I put in the specs in like division one, like, contractors shall provide Starbucks coffee every morning to, <laughs> to construction firm <laughs> or, or architecture firm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, is that really going to happen or is that like, well, what are you going to substitute that with? Yeah, exactly. Right. right? Like AM PM coffee. Um, but I guess my point is like, are the specs even read? And from the standpoint, yes, they are read. Mm -hmm. Contractors read them. They live off them. That's where they make their money. Yeah. You know, it, and it's as an architecture firm it's it baffles me that specs need to be a priority across the industry they need to be taught mm -hmm. so one of the things that we're doing now um is i've got a presentation and hopefully it will start in the next uh quarter but all new hires they get to come to me and i get to teach them specs for two hours Look teach them specs and teach them you know 
our process. You're turning into a professor too. Yo, and right? I love it. I yeah. love teaching. Wow. And part Good of me trip. is like, maybe I should email Cal Poly Pomona and just see, hey, throw it out there, make an elective. Like I'd be willing to do it because it, it just doesn't, you know, it's not about me. Mm-hmm. It's about the industry. It's about others. Because if you come out of college and you understand specs, you're so much farther along than yeah. anyone else. And I see it with our interns. They're so much better prepared mm-hmm. because I talk to them for four or five hours yeah. than the ones that just get hired, you know, off the street that just graduated. Sure. You know, they, they, it's still a tough concept to grasp, mm-hmm. but they know if they're detailing like, like, Hey, we've got this toilet accessory. Like they ask the question, is this in the spec? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's an important question because if it's not, Exactly. You know, that that's a problem. Well, part of the uh, language when I was working in the field is the specs always superseded the drawings. Mm-hmm. Always. Yeah. And it. I think for us right now, it's uh, it, they're equal. It just depends on, on how Division One or like the general conditions are written mm-hmm. and, and who writes them. Um, for us, they're they're equal, but it's, you know, greater quality and greater quantity rules the day. You mm-hmm. know, that that's how we uh, decipher between. So if, you know, the, the drawings have, um, or I should say if the specs, because they don't call out quantities or locations, but if we're calling out for whatever reason we put in there, basketball hoop one, but on the drawings, you know, you've got four basketball hoops and it's shown four, the greater quantity wins the day, you know, the contractors got to provide the four, you know, not just one. So got it. Got it. So that's, that streamlines it. Yeah, very much so. And I'm sure there'll still be an RFI on it and stuff. But I mean, at least, you know, from our side, we've got our butt covered and yep. stuff like that. Yep. So we actually had, and it was a, it was a RFI that came in. And you know how drawings, they typically say, you know, typical, mm-hmm. you know, half inch wall, typical. Sure. You know, um, we had diagram basketball courts, but we only did one to save time. And we put basketball court typical. And the contractor, he was bad contractor, said, I'm only providing one. <laughs> even though even though you want four, I'm only providing one. And our response is, yeah, but it says typical. Yeah. And, w- and we show the four. We just didn't call out everything on the details. And so, uh, you know, I went in my boss and <laughs> he had a few choice words. Mm-hmm. But he's like, he's got no ground to stand on. And no lawyer would even take up that case. Mm-hmm. You know, so... It, Stuff like that so yeah. baffles me that that's out there. You know, you mm-hmm. still have some guys playing games and stuff like sure. that, but uh, it shouldn't be that way. No, and right. I I tell people this, or at least tell the, the people in my firm, is there more of an industry that's built on litigation? Well, there's so many moving parts to it, and um, what ended up happening, you're you're seeing like some big changes because. Um, contractors subcontractors could see problems in drawings and specs Mm -hmm. right and they would bid it and then they want to make they'll come in cheap on these things and then they'll come in on the change orders they'll know that this stuff is bad oh yeah but what ends up happening is you know with design assist and design Mm -hmm. build and stuff like that um they never wanted to take on the liability of taking on the liability Mm -hmm. right so you you drew this you own it yeah okay and so if this thing goes sideways we're going to build it how you drew it yeah and now that has changed up a lot to where you know they are the professionals and then they're kind of giving you guys some options Mm -hmm. of of you know faster ways to build stuff Mm -hmm. um sometimes uh it may not be the products that you guys want or the systems that you want to put in because like we were talking earlier, um, sometimes spending money in the front end is way better than spending dollars in the back end. Oh yeah, most definitely. It, you, you need, it's pr- called prevention mm-hmm. and um, to tear into stuff and get attorneys involved and do all this stuff for failures uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. It's stupid. It's driving yeah. up the cost of construction. Mm-hmm. So, You know, that you knowing products that are out there that are going to reduce liability for everybody that's involved and specifying that and then knowing the argument. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Knowing knowing the answer to that. And this is the reason why. And we're not going to accept a substitution for this. And this is why. Yeah. So 
you guys are the experts in this industry. You're going to install this. So sometimes you do have to put your heels in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and not definitely. accept the the um, because sometimes you know they may be uh, wanting to substitute something that's not as good. Oh know? yeah, oh yeah. Sometimes their shit's cheap for a reason. Yeah, right? well, we get that all the time. Yeah, you know, and you it's, see it daily. Oh yeah, and it's one of those things where you know I have a gripe about public bid, mm -hmm. um, especially in the state of California where we're you know financially maybe not in the best position and how we get funding for schools and stuff like that and you get these public bid jobs on schools and it's you get terrible contractors you don't get the good ones because no. they get priced out yeah and yet here we are spending taxpayer dollars yeah. at schools with kids in them where if something happens everybody's liable and no one wants to see that happen right yeah but it, it's like as an architect or as a contractor, I don't want to specify anything that's going to put liability on my firm. I don't want to, same thing with a contractor. Mm -hmm. They don't want to install anything that's going to put liability on them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, why can't, why do we have to have the word or equal? You know, why do we have to have, you know, companies that we've never heard of bid mm -hmm. when, really it's up to the architect to determine the quality of work mm -hmm. and say, Hey, these three manufacturers meet our requirements or this one we want. We mm -hmm. don't want someone from Timbuktu saying, Oh yeah, we got all that testing data. We got everything, but is their product truly an or equal? No, nothing in my mind is an or equal. It could be an equivalent, sure. but it it's, and that, I guess that's the, the problem I have is you're messing with taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Um, and the projects really never come in on, you know, on budget. It's no. usually always over. Mm -hmm. And it's it hurts the taxpayer and it, it hurts, you know, the school and the district or the owner as well. Um, so I, that's why I'm a huge proponent of, you know, design build mm -hmm. because we, we do a lot of design build projects. And those are the ones that win awards mm -hmm. um, because of the cooperation between the contractor and the architect. Mm -hmm. um, and they put together great products. Um, which is great. And, you know, I never hear any, any gripes about, you know, frivolous RFIs or substitution requests or anything like that. It's, it's always, you know, sit down at a table and let's, let's hash this out. Mm -hmm. You know, let's work together to get this done. Um, because everybody's top priority is to make money. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. You might not say it, you know, like our top priority is design or it's the bottom line, you know, money is your number one driving factor exactly because if you don't make it or you don't have it you can't do anything else exactly you know you're lying to yourself you say mm -hmm. oh yeah i just want to do a good product for for the owner or for the client well money you yeah. know money's 1a and that might be 1b yeah but at the end of the day we all want to make money the bottom line is always the bottom line exactly you and know. so it's great that you know design build design assist we can come together mm -hmm. and and figure out ways to not only provide a great product to uh, the client or the owner, but make money, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because in that, that allows for growth, that allows for jobs. And I know my firm, we're huge into giving back to the community and we couldn't do that if we didn't make money. Right. Right. You right. know, and they yeah. treat us well. Yeah. Um, they, we treat the community very well. So it's, mm -hmm. that's my gripe about public bid. Not a fan. Yeah. You know, if we could avoid it, be mm -hmm. great, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, at a young age, you have a lot of integrity. You really do. And that's, uh, you, you have that. Yeah. And that's you, something that my dad instilled in me when I was young. He always said, you got your morals and you got your ethics. Mm -hmm. That separates you from everybody else. Exactly. And exactly. so it, it's, uh, you know, it's funny how things end up, but that's one thing that I took with me and that I'll instill in my kids one day, hopefully yeah, yeah. is you've got your morals, you've got your ethics. It doesn't matter really what else you do. It's who you are as a person. Exactly. You know? Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. You're not trying to cheat anybody out of anything. No. And you're no. willing to put the extra time in to make it right. So oh, that, yeah. that's, that's an excellent quality. And, yeah. And, and I, uh, you know, when project teams come to me and it's like, Hey, you messed up or, you know, this is wrong again. I feel bad. I feel terrible. 
because that's just a delay in their schedule, right? Or, mm-hmm. or you know, even on my off days, like if someone emails me and like, hey, we got to get this out by 11, can you do it? And it's like, I feel bad because I'm not in the office. You know, I, I can't necessarily work on it. Um, you know, it's just that quality that I have where it's like, I just want to help people. Yeah. You know, and I that was part of the driving force to become a police officer was not because I want a gun and a badge, I want to help people, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to, I want to be there for people to help them out through situations. And I've been able to do that at my current job. You know, I I love it when, when someone comes like, Hey, we got a problem, can't figure it out. And I love that, Mm -hmm. you know, specs, specs are boring. (laughs) You know, I, I stare at them all day Mm -hmm. as much as I say they're important and they need to be, you know, fun and exciting they sure are boring to look yeah, at every yeah. day. Right. It, it's like it there. It's the written word too. Oh, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, you can't put different angles on words, right? No, I mean, no. it's, they're in straight lines and everything's so. the exact same. Like our insulation yeah. section, it never changes. Yeah. Like I know what I'm specifying. Yeah. You know that to break up the day, I love those, those emails that I get. I mean, sure. it, that's what really motivates me to, to expand in this industry. Hey, you've only just begun, man. I know. I know. You, you're, I've you're, got a long way to go. You're still, gonna go places. But you're you're one definitely day, hopefully. gonna go places. Hopefully. You're you're on your way. Hopefully. Because you're <laughs> uh you're you you have initiative and um you can't learn that. That that's either in you or it isn't. And yeah. you you're you're willing to put your extra time in to make stuff better. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, it's it's a it's not easy. No, nope. you know, for nope. all these these young listeners out there, it's mm-hmm. not easy. Yeah, there are, there are lots of times where it's you know you get the phone call from your wife. Why are you still at work? Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. like just trying to make things better. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like sometimes you just got to put the the pen and paper down sometimes and spend time with family. But mm-hmm. you know, you just got to grind it out and and realize that there's there's light on the other side of the tunnel. Exactly. You yeah, know? it's they're tall mountains. Oh yeah, but uh, you keep scratching away, and and you'll get up to the top of that, whatever that top is. Yeah, you know what I mean, because usually, like, um, we sound a little bit similar to where you know I like I like solving problems, mm-hmm. and I can't shut that off. And it sounds like with the your mind, the way that you look at a lot of stuff is you can't shut it off either. No, but it's so you tough. have to tell yourself to. Right? <laughs> it's it's so tough. Like, I, I have t- so. What do you do for fun? What do I do? I golf. Okay. You know, I'm, awesome. I'm a big golfer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before I was married, I was I was golfing every weekend. I'm part of a men's club mm-hmm. that my father-in-law runs, so I was golfing every weekend. You know, I was getting really good, and then you get married, and not because I'm married. And my wife tells me no, right? It, it's more the oh, we're still trying to pay off the wedding and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. now I've cut it down to about once, maybe twice a month. But uh, golf is. It's great. It's it's my stress relief. So nice. Um. So yeah, and I nice. I grew up golfing, grew up snowboarding in Mammoth. You know. Nice. Um. Yeah, I had some fun times. With my you know when my dad selling boxes, doing really well. We'd be up there at least twice a month on the weekends. So uh, so and that was four or five years in a row. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was great. So trying to get back into that a little bit. Yeah. You know, I had your wife do that. She doesn't. You know, I'm gonna try to push her this winter. To see if we can go up. Put her and, in lessons, dude. Oh, yeah. Don't well, try to teach her. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know how that goes. Beat it, her for lunch. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I'm more of the guy that I, fits my personality. I can't do runs. I've got to go off the beaten path. Mm. I've got to go down some trees. I've got to go it. down some fresh powder. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, meeting her at lunch would, would work well. Yeah. But, uh, but golf is, you know, it's what I do right now. Cool. Um, you know, spending a lot of time with the family is also a big one. Um, especially during the summertime, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many things to do in, in California. So, um, does your mom still live in North Dakota? Yes, she does. Yeah. So, uh, my parents got divorced a couple of years ago. Um, so she moved back there. Cost of living is much cheaper. And sure. So she lives back there. Um, so I haven't gone back and, and seen her. She usually comes out here, but Mm-hmm. I haven't seen her in a couple of years, so mm-hmm. I think this winter we'll probably try to go back and see her if she doesn't come out here. But uh, so yeah, and then my dad lives in the same condo complex as me. So oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. So I see him every once in a while, you know, out mm-hmm. on walks or something like that. Sure. 
so it, it's great. And then my sister, you know, lives here in, in uh, Brea, so she's mm-hmm. right up the street. So see her quite often. And then I have an older brother who's uh, he's a physician's assistant. And he, he actually, I like to say he got the idea from me because he moved back to Fargo, North Dakota, where I went to school. So got he's it. back there now, and he's got three kids and a wife and doing well. So, so. you were in Fargo, eh? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's where I was. And you know God, what? It's freaking cold, dude. I loved it. You know, you talk yeah. about Midwest nice. Mm-hmm. It is a thing. People are so much nicer. Mm-hmm. The speed limits suck. You know, it's yeah. 25 miles an hour everywhere. And if you go 26, you're getting a ticket. But it's just, it's a different lifestyle. It's slower. Yeah. Um, if we could, we'd probably move back to Minneapolis, my wife and I, because mm-hmm. that's where a lot of our friends are and, um, you know, some family, but cost of living so much cheaper. And mm-hmm. it's just, there's, you know, California, there's a lot to do, but you got to travel to do it. You got to be, you got to go in traffic, right? Mm-hmm. Minneapolis, everything's there. It's wide open. Yeah. So, and it, one thing I will tell my kids or, you know, my nieces and nephews or whoever, college, if you do well in high school, college is, if you're willing to go, is your one opportunity to go wherever you want. That's true. That's you know, very you true. don't, you don't have any tie downs. Mm-hmm. You can, you can go wherever you want. You're right. And I tell my, my nieces now, I said, you're always welcome home. Mm-hmm. you know um yeah. so at least go try it sure sure so uh but yeah fargo north dakota minus i think the coldest it ever got was minus 55 you know yeah. so and and that's why people from california don't want to go there no they you know, don't it's the winners man yeah you walk out and your your nose hairs freeze yep and then people are like how like what does it feel to be that cold I'm like anything below zero feels the same to me yep it just depends on how long it takes for it to hurt. That's true. You know, you walk outside and it's like, oh yeah, my legs hurt now. They're, they're cold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, walking from class to class, that was, that was miserable. Yeah. Right. But, uh, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, made good friends and, uh, one of those things that kind of wish maybe I picked a different city than Fargo. You know, well, but it is what it is. And but you got to see the, the scenery around there. You know, it you, is. You, you, you dug, you've got to uh, melt into the woodwork, I guess. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 And just see the uh, how a different part of the country lives. You know, a lot of my classmates were uh, farmers and, um, you know, so they were there for the first semester or maybe it was the second semester, but they were only there for one semester a year. Then they had to go help out on the farm, and yep. so they were on that long schedule. And then you learn about career paths, about like uh, um, agronomy, right? Like I didn't know what agronomy was, but for those that don't know, it's um, you basically go out and you tell the farmers what to plant and how to plant, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, hey, so and I general idea basically is all right. So you got to go down to a depth of like six inches before you plant your seeds, something like that. Or this is how much you need to water. This is how much you need to turn the soil over. Or, you know, this is the projections on plants, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, costs and everything. So it's, you learn about stuff like that, Yeah, you know, which is, which Shit, is I cool. didn't know that. Yeah. And yeah. you know, that, that's at least what I understand. It could be, you know, completely wrong, but that's, that's what I learned. You're going to have there, to dig so. into the specs on that one. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you, you see John Deere tractors driving down the road and yeah. stuff and yeah. it, it's cool. It it's was, like going back in time, right? Oh yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, and something that I learned was, so their streets, they're not asphalt, at mm-hmm. least in Fargo, it's just concrete. So then they've got control joints every i think it was like five ten yards something like that mm-hmm. but it's all concrete they don't have uh asphalt at least in the city and i think the reason is when they plow you don't want to go over or underneath the asphalt and rip it up yeah and then also they can do chains but the salt's easy uh, you know it's much better on the concrete it would sure. probably tear up the asphalt and stuff, yeah but, it lasts a lot longer mm-hmm so, but yeah, it was a great experience. And That's awesome. Yeah. That I, would, awesome. I would recommend it to a lot of folks. If you're looking to go out of state, go to North Dakota State. They've won, was it seven out of eight, the last NCAA, the FCS, 
championships. Yeah. So Carson Wentz, quarterback. Yeah. You know, yeah. Billy Turner. I think he's still an old offensive lineman somewhere. But yeah, it's getting notoriety out there. Yeah. Which is great. For so. sure. For sure. Sounds like a great experience. Yeah, it's one that I will never forget. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, and my wife pretty much. We did long distance two years back in college and she followed me out there and I know she's grateful for it too. Mm -hmm. Um, just to see how, like I said, the other side lives. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy and you can run out or run into a, a rude person here. It seems like every day, you know, whether you're just driving in your car and they're honking your horn at you or whatever back there, everybody's nice. It's, that's neat. it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It, I never ran into a rude person mm -hmm. anywhere. Even if I had questions, nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was, fantastic to say that's awesome that's so, awesome yeah glad was, you got to experience that yeah it, it was i'm glad i made the choice you know mm -hmm. like i said i was slated to go to san marcos i had um you know everything ready to go there and then last minute it was like well i could go to fargo or i could go to grand forks and grand forks is great um my uncle calls it the the shithole of the universe because there's literally nothing there and it's colder than fargo um, but it, it's still a good town, but yeah. you know, Fargo was just a better fit. You know, they actually had an airport and stuff. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. a three gate airport, but shit has so, been yeah. in a movie. Yeah. yeah. Well, funny fact, they didn't film it in Fargo. Probably. Yeah. No, probably I, not. I believe it was Bemidji, Minnesota, I think is what they filmed it in. Mm. Most of it's filmed in Minnesota actually. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Wow. So, but that's okay. one question I get all the time. Yeah. yeah Fargo, you seen the movie and yeah. Bits and pieces. Yeah. You know, so. So when you were there, did you ever cross the border? No, never went up <clears> to <throat> Canada. No. But, uh, so when I worked it's at, right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I never went because I, I don't have a passport mm. um, and never really had a, a drive to go up there. Yeah. Um, but one of the funny things was when I worked at Costco, I'd have to do the gas station some days, mm -hmm. you know, attend the gas station. And there was something about. Canadian when they'd come down you know they'd travel they go to our malls and stuff because it's a little bit cheaper I think but they couldn't work the gas pumps yeah that's weird like up in Oregon you're mm -hmm. not allowed to pump your own gas yeah yeah it's a trip yeah like they, yeah. they'd come out and they'd have you know their debit card but at Costco you can only or their credit card but Costco you can only use their your debit card or you know, the approved credit card basically so right. if you had a MasterCard you couldn't use it <clears throat> and so they were Costco members but you know, just trying to figure out how to insert the, the card in was wow. weird or how to, you know, pump gas. And I ran into a couple of those and I'm like, it can't be that much wow. different. You wow. know, it, it was just one of those, one of those weird things. Well, you know, also too, I think when you go, um, over there, they don't have the, the rubber piece. Oh yeah. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. like the diesel pump, mm -hmm. you know, everything is like that. So yeah. they don't have that, that, uh, spring loaded rubber piece that's in there so that kind of maybe gives them a little bit of a um they need some instruction oh yeah well it i had to drive out there my last year i took took my car back there and it's amazing just to see between the different states the the gas levels so like 87 or 89 80 mm -hmm. or 91 90 whatever it is right yeah every state's different yeah you yeah. know i yeah. mean it, it's and i remember we were coming back and I was about to go up the Rockies. So I was in Denver and I filled up and I think I filled up with like 85, mm. you know, low, it was super low octane wow. and going up the hill. Everything was pinging, huh? Oh God, I barely made it up there and yeah. I drive a Toyota Yaris. So, <clears throat> um, but it, it was barely going up the hill and I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I put 85 in. So then as soon as I could, uh, I, stopped at a gas station and i think i put like the premium blend in and mm -hmm. made a huge difference yeah um but it just crazy and same thing i guess with wyoming i think they're they're Got very it. low too but Got it's it. you know california just has those wonderful voc regulations exactly. and everything else along the exactly. lines that they have so. exactly exactly yeah yeah um hostile yeah you know, very hostile yeah so so like you can't buy paint thinner in california anymore I didn't know that. No. Well, and if you can, it's 50 bucks a gallon. Oh, that's crazy. Know, type of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's not very friendly, you know, yeah. as far as that goes. And um, they d are just making it difficult. And, like, young guys like you are, uh, 
you may not be here in the future. You know, mm-hmm. may move to another state because you're well, sick of all that BS. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm I tell my wife, I'm I'm open. If you yeah. ever want to move, mm-hmm. you know, I, I could probably work from home. You yeah. Know? But yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. if you ever want to move, yeah. you know, family's huge to us. Our family's here. Her family's here. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, it'd be tough to leave. But sure. You know, you're right. California one day. It's expensive. It is. You know, very trying very. to just trying to save up for a home is incredible it is you know and just everything else going on it's very tough yeah even i paid my car registration a couple weeks ago Mm -hmm. and i remember paying that probably four or five years ago and it was a 100 bucks and Mm -hmm. that was damn near 150 yeah i'm like (laughs) and i had to get it smogged i gotta get smogged every two years and it's like this is a joke yeah it's it's all uh it's a bunch of barnacles that want to latch onto you and and they're money grabbing and they want to get it any way that they can yeah, and you know, they can take money, fine, spend it wisely. Exactly. You know, I don't know if they're that, spending it exactly. it wisely. Yeah. You know, you still look at our roads, and they're still you know torn yeah. up, yeah. terrible. You know, the fifty seven coming down, it yeah. was like oh god, Baja. oh it's yeah. terrible, yeah. terrible. I was yeah. on the wife with my phone. She goes, "What's that?" And I was like, "It's the road." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was shit, just a man, bumpy we can part. sit in here for another six hours and talk oh, about this shit any yeah. day, right? These guys are like, they're they're crazy. They're oh, crazy. it's. It, great state love the weather i it it's paradise man oh it's great it really is it's just the people that are running it are eh, eh, yeah gosh. It, which you know what as long as you know you don't take some of my my liberties away mm-hmm. my civil freedoms yeah. you know what whatever it be you know as long as we're living in great 75 weather most of the yeah most of the year and you, you have you the beach and the mountains and you we have 16 climate zones buddy and uh no other place on the planet i think has that no um and you can hit you can hit a bunch of them in the same day oh yeah here so and and enjoy it so it's uh that's why it's so populated Mm -hmm. you know people are coming here for the weather jeff you've had uh, like a really inspiring story oh thank you it it was it was awesome i didn't even expect it and i was actually (laughs) a little nervous to get you in here because uh again you're the first professional yeah in in that end of the industry that's come in here and and the youngest yeah and um you super interesting man you taught me a lot of stuff today thank you yeah i you know i was nervous too so it was like i wonder what i can talk about you know because i I don't have some of those stories that some of the the older guys have but Mm -hmm. i'm glad i kept you entertained that's awesome man. thank you very much yeah thank you for having me again it was a pleasure so yeah you have a great weekend yeah thank you you too see ya